Well, hello everybody and welcome back to another edition of Telescope Man. Today I'm going to kind of do a little listing of some of the things I need, I think, need to be changed in the technician's test. Now, I know what you old timers are going to say. Well, if you want stuff changed in the technician's test, why don't you start getting involved and, uh, you know, send off your request to the uh, BE teams that are working on the test every uh, few years. I know that's what you're going to say. Uh, so, uh, I'm aware of that. I am a BE. So, uh, but I think it's uh, still good for us to talk about... <clears throat> some of the changes that probably need to be made, especially to the technician's test. I'm a proponent, as you may or may not know, of giving technicians some digital privileges on the HF bands, not just 10 meters. I'm talking a little bit, you know, across the uh, spectrum. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, this would serve to create more interest in the hobby. It certainly wouldn't in involve any interference to what CWs are doing, CW operators are doing, or anybody else is doing. Uh, I would have no problem uh, sending an FT8 uh, message. Uh, to a technician that happened to be operating FT8 in the prescribed areas uh, for FT8. So not a big problem to me. I don't actually even see what the problem might be. So uh, with that said, I've got a little list of some of the changes I'd like to see happen. They basically all revolve around the fact that uh, technicians come in, they study the test questions, memorize them, you know, in many cases, take the test, uh, go out and buy an HT radio, a little handy talkie, and they come back with basic questions uh, that should have been covered in the uh, classes and in the books and in the testing, all right, should have been covered. So let's go through those and we'll talk about it. I've got to put my glasses on because I'm old and I can't see. So some of the changes I'd like to see happen are more operational type questions. Actually, how do you, questions about how you would set up a mobile radio in your ham shack. How you would set up a mobile radio in your car or truck. Those types of questions. Number two, how would you program in the local repeaters into your mobile radio or HT. How? With specific questions about that. Uh, this seems to be the, the first question they ask after they buy a radio is I can't figure out how to get uh, repeaters in my mobile or HT. That needs to be covered in the classes. And needs to be some questions on the testing about that. <laughs> what is a PL tone? I'm trying to think back to the test if there's even a question about what is a PL tone. Memory doesn't serve me very well now, but I don't believe that there's even one question on the test uh, technician's test about what a PL tone uh, is or what it does on a repeater. Okay? <clears throat> Remember, that's going to be their uh, most common mode of communications. It's going to be through a repeater. 
when they first get their technician's license. So there needs to be some, uh, the class needs to cover repeater operations from a practical standpoint along with some questions about how to make contacts on a, on a repeater. Maybe even some question, uh, questions about why there's no traffic on the repeater uh, during most of the day when everybody's working. All right, that might be a good question to cover in a, in a technician's test. All right, number four. <clears throat> Again, I don't remember anything about this, but there needs to be some questions uh, and and uh, on Yagi versus omnidirectional antennas, the differences. Okay, I'm not talking about how to build one. Okay, not talking about building anything. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm talking about knowing what the difference is. People don't even know what a Yagi is. So we get to trying to help them. We say, you know, the only way you're going to reach the repeater is you're going to have to go out there and buy this little uh, FM uh, frequency uh, dual band Yagi. And their eyes glaze over. <laughs> they don't know what that is. All right. Uh, and they don't know what an omnidirectional antenna is or even what the pattern of these antennas would be. Those are the kind of questions. Practical uh, practical uh, knowledge that you can use when you're a technician. There needs to be something in the class about what you can expect from a mobile radio and or a handy talkie as far as range goes. And this could probably include some little discussion of propagation or uh, the use of uh, questions on the use of six meters or on uh, some of the uh, microwave uh, frequencies that uh, technicians can use. You know, but they need to have a knowledge of uh, what they're getting into. They go out there and they buy one of those HD radios back there, and they live in a small town, and there's only one repeater in that town that they can hit, and there's never anybody on it, and they think that, that, that it's that way across the bands, on HF, everywhere else, that's their impression of amateur radio. Nobody is on it. Alright, so we've got to get around that uh, uh, HT limited range stuff they get into when they, buy, when they first get in the hobby and they don't understand why they can't reach the repeater. They just spent money on a radio and uh, why there's nobody on the repeater at uh, 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? Needs to be some stuff in the classes about that and actually needs to be a test question. Why is there no one on the repeater generally at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? A. They're all working. B. They all quit the hobby. C. No one likes ham radio. D. All of the above. You know, something, something like that. All right. <clears throat> Number six. Needs to be a heavy, heavy discussion in classes about the digital modes that can be used on VHF, UHF, and six meters and other places. Heavy discussion. This ties in uh, computers with radios. And nowadays, every most younger people are very computer literate. And it kind of gives them a more broad view of the amateur radio hobby and what they can do in the hobby 
other than just push the button and talk to somebody on the repeater. So there needs to be a heavy emphasis, especially in today's uh, times um, where we have many new digital modes coming out. Uh, needs to be uh, part of the class needs to be on digital modes, discussing various type of ones, and on the operation of the software and how to use that with a radio. Needs to be some discussion on that. Needs to be some questions on that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Number seven. There needs to be some specific uh, uh, classroom instruction and questions on the digital radios that are coming out right now. D-Star, Fusion, DMR. Got to talk about those in the class. Got to talk about those, and you have to ask questions uh, about that. What's the difference between digital modes and analog, for example? Could be a whole bunch of questions there. All right. If you ignore the digital uh, radios that are coming out, D-Star, Fusion, uh, uh, Wires, and DMR, I mean, you, you have taken the, the most recent, uh, quote, ham innovations in the hobby and just ignored them. You ignored an entire segment of the hobby. That was number seven. Let me turn the page and get number eight. Needs to be some uh, <coughs> classroom instruction and questions on how to operate portable using a mobile radio. Especially when a big, or usually the first thing a new ham radio operator gets into is emergency communications. Uh, whether it be RACES or ARIES or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> They generally kind of gravitate, at first at least, over to MCOM, Emergency Management Communications. So it behooves us to give them some classroom instruction on how to operate portable, practically operate portable, and uh, <clears throat> some of the challenges of doing that. Uh, out in the field if you don't have any uh, uh, mains power available. They need to know how to do that. Needs to be some questions on that. Number nine, satellite communications. Yeah, I know it's uh, there's little dab of stuff on satellite communications. Little tiny bit that needs to be expanded. That's one of the technical El Nido things that amateur radio operators can do, and it's kind of been uh, uh, left to the, you know, it's kind of a secret thing in, in the testing. <laughs> it's just one little segment there about satellite communications, and that's it. it needs to be expanded a bunch with practical applications of how to make satellite uh, communications to include building a small Yagi. All right, or how are you going to power this radio that's hanging off your shoulder? You know, that all needs to be covered. Sat communications <clears throat> needs to be some questions on satellite communications more than there is now. Now, you know, about all these things are more questions that have been added to the test, basically. And you're saying, hey, Joe, you, you've done got the test up to 75 questions. I say, no, I haven't got it up because number 10 is elimination of questions covering how a radio functions, how to, how circuits function, 
And the only math question should be how to determine the uh, length of an antenna. That should be that one little uh, 428 divided by the frequency or whatever number you want to use uh, divided by the frequency. That should be the only thing taught as far as math questions. All those other ones, all of them. Need to go by the wayside. Nobody nowadays is building a radio. Very few people. Only people my age. 95% my age are actually repairing old radios like that Collins KWM2 back there. If it breaks, they send it off to an expert to be repaired. If my flex breaks, you think I'm going to go in there and start messing with the circuits in there? No, I'm going to pack it up and I'm going to send it to Austin, Texas. And they're going to fix it for me and it's going to come back like brand new. All right. So all those repair questions, any kind of circuit questions that uh, there's really no need for that. Why do they need to know circuits? What in the heck? Let me just say it another way. What in the hell are they going to use circuit diagrams for? When they can't even program an HT. You haven't taught them how to program an HT, but you're teaching them circuits. What's wrong with you? Anyway, all those questions need to be eliminated. One or two probably need to stay. Very few, um, and it needs to become more operationally targeted and less electronic circuit math targeted. All right. Anyway, that's my view on the subject. You can comment down in the comments below. But that's my view. Don't hit me up and say, well, why don't you get involved with the national uh, VEs that set up the test? Don't give me that kind of question. I'm 71 years old. I can't get involved. If you're 30 years old and you think I'm right, then you get involved. All right. I've already made a video. It's going to be posted on YouTube. All right. So all my subscribers are going to see it, many of them ham radio operators. So that's my part. <clears throat> all right, that's my part. Anyway, as I usually do, I wish you clear skies in 73. And remember to keep looking up to see the greatest show on earth right over your head every single night. And I'm going to post a link to a fella ham, fellow ham, He's not a great speaker, okay, but uh, I want you to start listening to the, his video at about the 13-minute level. Just skip on out there and start listening to what he's talking about. He got his license, his tech license, and he is totally lost. He doesn't have the slightest concept uh, of what he can actually do with the radios and or why he's having uh, such an issue in the little town that he is a ham radio operator in. Seems to be a really nice guy and I kind of feel sorry for him and uh, I've been trying to help him all I can uh, online. But look at that link down there to the video and skip ahead to about 13 minutes and start listening. Okay? Until next time, subscribe. See y'all later. Be good.